Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are talking about the U.S. educational system. Our guest, Jennifer Berkshire, writes about education and politics for the nation, the New Republic, the Baffler, the New York Times, and other publications, creator and co-host of the Education Policy Podcast, Have You Heard? She teaches in the Education Studies Program at Yale University and the Prison Education Program at Boston College. She is the author or co-author of two previous books and of the forthcoming The Education Wars, a Citizen's Guide and Defense Manual. Jennifer Berkshire, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for doing the work you're doing and for coming on. Uh, Maybe you can enlighten us on some vocabulary. What is school choice and what are education savings accounts? Well, so right off the bat, you're going to lead us into big topics and straight into the weeds. (laughs) <laughs> well, so, you can give the, the introduction as needed. So so we are in the midst of a fight that has been raging for a very long time about where kids should go to school and who should decide. And so what's happened is that over the past couple of years, a whole bunch of states, mostly red states, have enacted sweeping school voucher programs. And essentially what that does is that it, it has taxpayers now picking up the tab for families that send their kids to private, mostly religious schools. And so when we talk about school choice right now, that's essentially what we're talking about. An education savings account is a slightly more expansive version of that. When you hear the word voucher, you probably think about what I just described, that somebody is, is it's basically it's a coupon uh, for uh, for a family to use for tuition at a school. An education savings account views that much more broadly, that it's up to the, to the parents to decide not just where the kids should go, but what school is going to be. So education savings accounts is basically, you know, like taxpayer funds are put on an edu debit card. They actually have these in Arizona. And then you decide what you want to do with them. Are you going to buy things on Amazon and call that school? Are you going to purchase an online homeschooling curriculum? It's completely up to you. How much money is on a debit card? And is it the same for kids in rich families, poor families, et cetera? Well, so the amount varies. And and in Arizona, it's actually a huge range. And what we're finding in all of these states, and Arizona is really the prime example, is that the funds are going overwhelmingly to wealthy families because suddenly these programs have essentially made sending your kids to private schools more affordable. And so a big report just came out from the Brookings Institution reaching this conclusion beyond any shadow of a doubt. Arizona's new universal school voucher program is a handout to its wealthiest residents. They are the ones who are making use of it. So it's not just that wealthier families are getting private, are getting public money for private schools as well as poor families, but they're getting more. If you're a wealthy kid, you need more public money for your private schooling. The amount of money you get depends on your particular need. This is a big sales pitch for the program. But, you know, part of what makes it so expensive is that they're they're trying to replicate the experience of school at a hyper individual level. And so the argument would be that, well, you know, David is now being he's getting an education savings account, but he really misses the experience of of gym class in school. And so we're going to order a bunch of gym like uh, materials on Amazon and we're going to call that school. And and so the that it's it's causing these it's it's becoming very expensive but the real discrepancy is that you know poor kids are not actually making use of these programs that in a state like Arizona the vast majority of families who are availing themselves of education savings accounts are wealthy and their kids already attended private school 
So poor families are, are not getting turned away. They're not applying for it. Correct. And they will ultimately pay a price because all of a sudden Arizona is spending close to a billion dollars a year on this program. And what my co-author and I have pointed out in publications like The Nation is that the same states that are enacting these sweeping programs that come with virtually no oversight, they're also cutting taxes on their wealthiest residents. And that means that in states like Arizona and, and uh, Iowa and Ohio, within just a few years, you're gonna have these programs exploding in cost at the same time that revenues are shrinking. And then the, the kids paying the ultimate price will be the ones who have remained in the public schools or rural kids who are in areas where there is no school choice, right? It's, if you have to ride 140 miles to get to the nearest religious school, that's not a choice. And so those kids are going to be left in schools that are now uh, having to compete for increasingly scarce resources by design. And, and how many states are doing something like this and how many have it in the pipeline? So over the past couple of years, we have seen uh, a growing number of states enacting these programs. This last year has really been the big one. State after state now have programs like this on the books. Um, Georgia, North Carolina right now is in the process of, of expanding its program uh, even further. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, there are actually only a handful of states where, where public education advocates have successfully banded together to defeat these programs, Idaho and Tennessee chief among them. Um, in uh, the, the states that have, that have enacted programs in the past two years is actually much longer. And, and, and is it all about private schools or is it about homeschooling as well? It's absolutely about homeschooling as well. That the that you have a robust coalition that includes both traditional uh, opponents of using taxpayer dollars to do anything, and those would be your your libertarians, um, but proponents of religious education. And their primary objective is to move kids out of what they refer to disparagingly as the government schools. And, and into, into religious education. And that can either be private religious education or homeschooling where parents are more directly able to, to shape the religious value of their kids. And that, I think that's really key here that, that we've got now this enormous gulf between the way the kids today view the world and the way that policymakers and advocates do. And so if you look at polling data on, on virtually every measure, the kids are saying, we believe that a strong state should do things like step in and fix climate change, make college more affordable, provide food and housing. And, and you have conservative uh, you know, grownups looking at this in horror and thinking, where are they learning this? It's got to be the schools. They're pointing at the college protests right now, right? And saying, where did they learn this stuff? It must have been K-12 education. It must have been indoctrination. This is why we've got to get them into private religious schools or have them homeschooled. It's actually rather mysterious to me. I went through public schools and I didn't learn much about supporting peace or opposing genocide. And, and I don't know where these kids learned it, but they're right. They're absolutely right. And the university administrators are apparently pro-genocide. Uh, but you have this increasing trend of kids getting random education from bizarre schools and in their homes. And yet in every poll of any political question, young people are smarter than old people. How does that happen? I think that, that is so interesting. And it's a source of perpetual frustration to folks who are, you know, who, who really believe that public education has been captured by the left and needs to be dismantled. There was a quote unquote study from the Manhattan Institute, and I'm saying it that way because, you know, it wasn't really a study. It was a, an advocacy brief, but they were, you know, uh, their frustration was that it's virtually impossible to inculcate kids 
from the values that they oppose. And those would be values of, you know, sort of a justice orientation, critical awareness. And so they went through and looked at how likely kids were to come out of school with a sort of social justice orientation. And to their great frustration, it really didn't matter much what kind of school it was, you know, that the, the kids today are woke and it's, it's proving very difficult to reverse engineer them into a different orientation. I want to extra engineer whatever it is that got them that way. And that's what I'm trying to figure out. Like, did, did they get it from Hollywood? Did they get it from applying all the endless lessons about the Holocaust to other genocides and don't have the level of hypocrisy required of them? Or where did they get it? I, I don't know. Um, uh, let me let me ask a different question. Jennifer Berkshire, uh, author of the forthcoming book, The Education Wars, A Citizen's Guide to Def and Defense Manual. Uh, what do you say to the family that needs an education that isn't available in the local public school, that needs a more challenging education or an education for a, a kid with particular needs? Uh, and there's a wonderful private school right up the street that provides it. What do you say to them uh, that they're part of a tragedy of the commons and they need to suck it up or, or, or what? Well, I think, um, I think talking to somebody like that and telling them that they are part of the tragedy of the commons is a disaster off the bat. Um, but one of the lessons that we're really seeing coming out of states that have sold programs, these private school voucher programs, to precisely those parents is the frustration of parents when they discover that you know the private school does not actually have to accept your special needs child and that that what we're talking about is not so much school choice as it is schools choice and then what i would what i would really want to do is to to have them be part of a broader organizing project to make their local public school more responsive because that's you know like that's on all of us and and unfortunately you know the world that we live in is a world where the language of individual choice is you know that's the air we breathe and the water we swim in and it's made it very difficult to to make a stirring case for public education the stakes feel very high and and particularly if you're a parent in an affluent community you are laser focused on getting your child into an elite academic institution. And so, you know, by four and five years old, you're already thinking about how do I supplement the public education in my community? How do I enroll my child in STEM camp? How do I enrich them so that they'll, by the time they're getting ready to apply, for that elite college, you know, they're thinking about it in ninth grade and, and all the way through high school, how do I make sure that they get a leg up? And so I really think that a lot of what's driving this is that level of intense anxiety among affluent parents. So is more spots in college and more affordability or free for college uh, a necessary part of the solution to high school and elementary school? absolutely lower the stakes for you know the last 30 years we have been sold a relentless message that as bill clinton put it you earn what you learn and that you know the your best hedge against against poverty and you know against a miserable life was to invest as much as possible in your own human capital and you were asking sort of jokingly a few minutes ago about you know what it, what it was that the 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 kids were were learning that would that give them essentially a progressive worldview and so much of it is a backlash to the sales pitch that they have lived through one systemic failure after another and so they've seen for themselves that this recipe for hyper individualized success that involves taking, you know, uh, acquiring lots of debt that you're personally responsible for, that it doesn't work. It's not enough. And so, so they're not entirely turning against college, but they're also saying it can't just be on me. 
maybe they are right. Uh, what? But what's motivating the people who are driving this privatization agenda? Is it libertarian funding? Is it religions? Is it particular religions? What's what's making this happen? I think it's so instructive to go back early in the 20th century when we were going through another raging battle about public education and and whether kids should have to go and at that point what people were really worked up about was child labor that you know there was a broad social movement to ban child labor because it was a real it was a scourge upon the land but then you had folks industrialists and libertarians and and the the first parents rights crusaders who argued uh, very passionately on their own that you know what not all kids are meant to go to school some of them are meant to work in factories and mines and i really feel that if you scrape away the language about school choice and you know education consumerism you find that original belief right there that a lot of what's driving this is this idea that you know we we tried to make the country more equal and we went too far and that that is the backlash to everything quote unquote woke in a nutshell and this idea that we're now going to dismantle public education which is where we heap all of our expectations regarding making the country more equal you know we're we tried it it didn't work and so instead we're going to go with this other older vision where you just give money to parents and and let them do with it what they will we also just this week had a big company including here in virginia charged with child labor in in meat factories uh nothing new there uh and most of the children were from families uh that don't have legal papers um and i wonder how much of this is about establishing an educational system that some people are left out of. Absolutely. And that if you are, if your goal is a steady stream of low wage labor, but also, you know, you're passionate about not raising wages and not allowing workers to band together and organize unions in order to, to fight for higher wages, then, you know, child labor is quite useful for you because you're, you know, that the low income family, the family that doesn't have papers, Think of all the pressure on them to to push their child into the workforce. You know, it makes economic sense. And then once the kid is in the workforce there, it's it's very difficult for them to stay in school. They're going to leave school early. And before you know it, we're looking at that that widening inequality that public education was in many ways, you know, established in this country to ameliorate. Right. That that we have public education because capitalism, unbridled capitalism in the Gilded Age was producing such inequality that people couldn't live with it. And I think now we're at a point where we have uh, inequality has widened to such an extent that that the loudest voices in the room happen to be billionaires who, frankly, have never been that keen on equality. And is it billionaires that are making this happen? I know for years it was the Walmart family, the Walton family plutocrats who were driving this single-handedly. Is that still what's happening? Where's where's the money coming from? Absolutely. You can go through the heartland, for example, where I'm from, and virtually every state has its own billionaire. And there are so many of them that if I went down the list, most of their names you wouldn't even recognize. You know Betsy DeVos in Michigan, and you probably know Jeff Yass, who's the richest man in Pennsylvania. He's been in the news because he's now a big Trump funder, and he had an early stake in, in TikTok. Um, but all of these folks, their top priorities are always school privatization and eliminating their state income tax. And at the end of the day, I, you know, I really believe it's because they view hierarchy as natural and even desirable, in part because they landed on the top. In, in Idaho, you mentioned in one of your recent articles or statements, there was a success in stopping this agenda, at least for the moment. How, how did that come about? The first trick there was just phenomenal organizing. But Idaho... 
Idaho also has uh, an interesting organization that I haven't seen in a lot of other states. It's a group of influential business leaders who are committed to public education and see this concerted effort to weaken it as a disaster for their state. And so they were a loud voice for saying that, that vouchers were a disastrous policy direction for the state, but also that vouchers are not conservative. Idaho is a very conservative state. So to a lot of people, it made no sense at all that you were suddenly gonna introduce a vast new spending program with no accountability at all. And, and you were just gonna say that, you know, like it was unaccountable by design. And so this Idaho business group was very influential. And finally, Idaho is very rural. Like not only is it one of our most rural states, but there are counties in Idaho that are so rural that they're considered frontier states. And so when these folks realized that their lawmakers not only were not going to fund their public schools, which are the central institutions in their communities, but we're going to figure out ways to divert money out of them. They were furious and they made that opinion uh, felt very loudly. Now, it's not exactly libertarian, is it, to tax all the money and then hand it out, even though you're handing it all out to different individuals. Uh, you're, it's, you still have the government controlling who gets which little mini pile of it, right? That's absolutely true. And that's why I think it's so important to focus on the end goal, which is not to continue to spend the same amount of money on public education that we always have, but to spend it somewhere else. The goal is ultimately to, to return the burden of paying for school onto the shoulders of consumers themselves, just the way we do for higher ed. Right. You decide how much am I personally willing to invest in my own human capital? Imagine if we now start to think about K-12 the same way. Imagine the kind of inequity that that is going to open up. Most crazy ideas that don't seem to work on their own terms and have hidden agendas have all this money behind them because they aren't actually popular with people. What are, what's the public opinion polling on this? Well, the answer to your question is, have any of these big programs been put up to a vote? No, because they know that any time the public in any state has gotten the opportunity to go to the polls and vote about whether they want to spend taxpayer dollars on private religious education, these programs are voted down overwhelmingly. And, you know, Arizona was a prime example of this just a few years ago. Voters there who, you know, you know how polarized Arizona is. They voted 65 to 35 to reject uh, private school voucher program. And then basically, you know, the, because of gerrymandering, their legislators don't feel like they have to be accountable to their own constituents. And so then they come back and enact a program that is even larger uh, than the program that the one of the voters voted down. Is, is there much polling done? And is there any information on what the kids think of this? Are there any disputes between kids and their parents on where they should go to school? <laughs> that So that would be so interesting to hear because I think what often gets lost in these conversations about parents' rights is that, you know, that there's no, you never hear them talking about the rights of kids at all. They're not so, kids anymore. They're and, kids now. <laughs> and the, and the, you know, when, when we talk about privatization, we think about, you know, a private school or somebody selling, making money by selling an education product. But, you know, the most private thing you can do is refuse to let your kid be educated outside of the home. And so the, you know, like when you think about your question in that context, the answer to what the child might think is they don't actually get a say. Yeah. Yeah. And what what kind of education are they getting? Do we know what kids are coming out of uh, these new private schools and existing private schools and homeschooling? with uh, how they do in life and in college uh, with these random, less regulated educations? 
The short answer is that we really don't know a lot by design, that all of the big new programs don't require any kind of accountability at all. And a big part of this is that earlier versions of voucher programs, especially, you know, the as they get bigger, kids fare worse. And the, so we do have big studies that were done and the results were terrible. And the reason is that the, the, the funding tends to prop up the lowest level of church schools. Like when we hear about a private school, we think of the fancy, like an Phillips Andover Academy with gates and lush lawns, but that is not the kind of, those aren't the schools that, that are accepting vouchers or depending on them. They're the, the fly-by-night Christian schools in a strip mall. And, and so the, that's why the, the research that we do have has been you know, pretty overwhelming that, that it, it's harming, they're harming kids. Wonderful. Um, what what should be done if people care about this? They're listening to what you're saying. They're agreeing. What can they do to help? We we've got like four minutes left. Uh, well, the most I think the most helpful thing you could do would be to pre-order my new book, The Education Wars. If you want to, if you're if you're out there and you're just trying to get a handle on why we're fighting about schools, why we're fighting about them so intensely right now, um, but also why public education is suddenly in so much danger. My co-author and I really tried to write the most accessible explanation that we could. And it's a call to arms. We talk to folks all over the country who are doing a phenomenal job organizing to protect defend and and really you know expand the mission of public education because that's what it's going to take we hear people say things all the time like you know public education is a pillar of our democracy but i think in many ways you know we've forgotten what that means because we're so focused on this high stakes battle to the next credential and and really you know making sure that that public education survives as an institution is going to require all of us to rally around a much more expansive understanding of why we have it sounds excellent everyone should get the book the education wars a citizen's guide and defense manual, uh, which I recommend despite uh, my preference for not calling everything in the world wars. Uh, <laughs> I spend most of my time trying to end actual wars. Uh, Jennifer Ber Berkshire, we have like two minutes left. Uh, uh, how did you get into this and how can people keep up with you and your work? Well, I, I started writing about education about 10 years ago, and I was interested in why Democrats were so enthusiastic about school choice and how many of them seem to be using the same rhetoric that I recognized from the right. And I just had a gut feeling that this wasn't going to end well. And here we are today in 2024, and it brings me no particular glee to say that I have been proven correct. And so I continue to, to delve into these issues on my podcast, which is called Have You Heard? Every couple of weeks, my co-author and I explore some, some policy debate in the world of public education. And then, of course, um, I, I also get the, the amazing opportunity to teach about this stuff. Right now, I'm teaching in a Massachusetts prison. And I'm about to wrap up uh, a class there on the politics of public education. And it has been very eye-opening. I can imagine. We may have to have another show just on prisons and education. Uh, we've been speaking with Jennifer Berkshire. She writes about education and politics in The Nation, The New Republic, The Baffler, The New York Times. Uh, she hosts the podcast, Have You Heard? And the forthcoming book will be called The Education Wars, A Citizen's Guide and Defense manual, which you can apparently go and pre-order right now. Uh, Jennifer Berkshire, thank you for coming on Talk World Radio. Thank you so much for having me. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network.
There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.